Some background? We all were born and live in Poland, so some things work here differently than in other countries. Me and my brother both suffer from glaucoma. He is currently blind, but he had better eyesight than me when we were kids. Our mom is not perfect. She is, in fact, very imperfect. She can be selfish, petty, egoistic, annoying, and she tends to forget everything wrong she did. But she will remember even the smallest slight against her, true or not, and will not forgive it. She has some characteristics of a classic sociopath, but if anyone just touched her children, they would invite their own doom. Hell has no fury like my mother pissed off. When it comes to wrath, Khan was a puppy when compared to our mother. First story happened when I was in fourth grade, at the end of May 1996. I went to a school for blind and visually impaired, as my left eye is broken. That year, we had a new class and a new teacher. Let's call him Mr. Jerk. Jerk. The class was a combination of how it works, home improvement and shop class. It was in 1996. Back then, it was okay for 10, 11-year-old kids to use hand tools. Our teacher was young, and in order to be more hip, or whatever you call that, with us, he threw at us one lines from 10, oh, one funny one, liners, and insults booklets. By this, he gave us permission to retaliate the same way, and we did, but because we were kids then, not only we were better at this, but also knew more biting responses. Because of the state of my sight, it's very hard for me to recognize faces, and almost impossible to see if someone is happy, sad, or pissed off at me. So one day I crossed the line and pissed off the teacher so much he actually sacked me in the head. Hard, hard. Side note, glaucoma increases dramatically the risk for retinal detachment, which can lead to blindness. And I already had one eye that didn't work. So I told it to my mom when she came to pick me up. My mom just straightened up, asked who witnessed it. Entire class of nine students. She grabbed one of my classmates. He went pale when she did and dragged us both to the principal's office. She barged in like Spanish Inquisition and asked our principal, If he knew what happened in his school and if he liked to have a visit from some journalist from the local radio station, the principal asked what it was about, and then she told me to tell the story, which I did promptly. She then asked, my friend, is it true, Kay? Is it, it is? Yes, ma'am, he mumbled, barely standing straight as he was shaken by my mom in the situation. We were told to leave. I'm sure Kay felt like a death row inmate getting amnesty just minutes from scheduled execution. Mr. Jerk was asked to come in after a few minutes of yelling. My mother suggested that she would smack his head a few times, pleading principal didn't want to have the media involved in suggestions that the Board of Education for the province will be informed. The teacher left, defeated and broken, and he never returned. Second story happened earlier in November or December. My brother went to normal public school. He was in eighth grade. His English teacher, our second language, didn't like him. His classmates didn't either. One day, my brother couldn't answer a grammar question. The teacher, let's call her... Dummy told his classmates that he needs a beating. Well, they assumed it was their homework, so as soon as classes ended, my brother was surrounded and beaten up by six or seven of them, while the rest of the class watched. I remember when he returned home that day, all bloody and bruised. My mom asked him what happened, and when he told her, she ordered me to get dressed. She took care of brother's injuries, and we went back to his school 20 minutes later. My mother was invited to the principal's office, both M's dummy, class teacher, Ms, incompetence and school counselor. This time I stayed outside the office, but despite the soundproof doors, I heard our mom yelling. Counselor was beaten with decibels for not doing his job. That is, dealing with classmates not liking my brother for being visually impaired. The class teacher was declared an incompetent idiot for not seeing signs that the classmates wanted to beat my brother, but only needed a reason to do it. Mrs. Dummy was informed that after her 15 years of experience, she is still a screw-up and won't teach anyone, anywhere. The Board of Education will be informed. End result was that Ms. Dummy was dismissed disciplinarily and lost her right to teach. Ms. Incompetence had a permanent negative mark in her record. The Board of Education was informed and my brother would move to my school. The principal was happy that she would never again have to face my mom. Sorry for the throwaway, but this situation is still within the statute of limitations and goes across state lines in the USA. Backstory. Backstory. Many years ago in rural Appalachia and coal country lived a cluster of families on a holler. Jim and Betty owned a mobile home and had their daughter, Kirsten, me, with them. This mobile home had two bedrooms and one bathroom, but it was sufficient enough for shelter. During the middle 1980s, a recession hit Appalachia hard and Jim found work in another part of the country. In moving, he approached Tilda, Betty's sister, and Larry, her husband, to look after the mobile home and collect rent for anyone that wanted to lease the mobile home. A rent amount was agreed to and would be adjusted for inflation and the cost of living for the area. 
The money was to be deposited into a savings account except for the money needed for necessary repairs and receipts kept. Jim and Betty trusted their siblings with this and moved, trusting that this money would be part of their retirement fund. I was privy to these conversations but did not pay that much attention to them at the time. Shortly after leaving Appalachia, a renter was found, and Jim and Betty were glad to know that something was coming about from the land in their home area. Then Mike, Larry, and Tilda's son moved into the mobile home and Jim stipulated that the rental agreement did not change even with his nephew renting the mobile home. After Mike moved out, Sonny, Larry, and Tilda's daughter moved in and stayed for several years. Betty asked Tilda several times about the rent, knowing Sonny was very unreliable with rent in the past, and was assured that between Section 8 and food stamps that the rent was being paid on time, and there were no issues. A few repairs had been done, but the receipts were stored in the safe deposit box where the savings account was. Fast forward a few more years, Sonny finally moves out, and there are a few more renters, and then the taxes are not getting paid. The mobile home will not pass for Section 8 any longer. As we, Jim, Betty, and I have been told repairs had been made over the years, we find this odd and inquire again to Tilda, who states this was all a misunderstanding. Once again, Betty trusts her sister and is relieved when we get the tax receipt in the mail. This is very important later. Another few years pass, and Tilda dies. Jim and Betty attend the funeral and Betty makes a gesture to assist with some of the expenses. Larry agrees, and Betty requests access to the savings account that should have at least tens of thousands of dollars by this point, not including interest to only find out it has never existed. All of the paperwork has been fraudulent and are forged. Remember that tax receipt? Another forgery? Betty refused to fight. She had just lost her sister. Still, Jim's livid, as am I. Sonny was always abusive to me, and to find out she had been living off my parents for free while receiving Section 8 for rent, and getting food stamps sent me over the edge on top of the missing retirement funds. Qui revenge. So knowing everything was fraudulent from the beginning, Jim and I attempted legal means first to get revenge on this thief. We were met with walls of red tape and with states separating us. It was an uphill battle with a slim chance of winning. Plus, the attorney fees would drain any winnings and then more. First, I put my piece into action. Against Sonny, I filed claims of fraud against the Section 8 anonymously and SNAP benefits, given that there was absolutely no proof of rent being paid to the homeowner or the custodian. Larry was stupid enough not to write out a fraudulent receipt for when his daughter lived there. Next, I filed against Larry for tax evasion and social security fraud since Sonny was claiming to be paying him the rent money via Section 8. This was income. Since he was not claiming this income on his tax forms, he was double-dipping into the social security system and avoiding paying taxes. I did the same for the time Mike was paying rent, although he did not claim government benefits. He just paid rent. The next stage was to notify their local church about the shady dealings with family. Their faith is big on lay ministers and credibility. I told anyone and everyone I could from the church directory about what had happened. I even showed the fake tax receipt. The last bit was the most nefarious. After ensuring that Larry was visiting Sonny and the house he owned was empty, a rented car was used, and while Betty drove Jim used a twenty two rifle to shoot holes in the roof, the AC compressor, the garage doors, and anything that was laying in a yard, and not immediately noticeable. We wanted the burn to last so no windows were shot out or anything evident from the start showed. Aftermath. Sonny is now being investigated for multiple charges or fraud. Her side business has been closed due to the sweeping allegations that money will not be allocated as intended. Her applications for small business loans and COVID funds have been denied. Criminal charges are being whispered, but I do not think anything will come about with that portion. Larry has been found guilty of overpayment by the Social Security Administration and no longer receives benefits. He now lives with Sonny and no longer has his truck, camper, boat, or a TVs. Unfortunately, once again, criminal charges are not pending. Larry Jor, another son of Larry and Tilda, had moved into the old home that was shot up. The roof had several places where hail or other debris punched through and made it leak. The siding had similar damage. Some of the bullets, and they finally figured out what it was pierced some of the old PVC slash plastic plumbing. He has spent a fortune fixing the roof, plumbing, and siding where a lot of little holes were. I do not know if he has tried the AC yet, and I will be delighted to find out if it malfunctions as severely as I hope. He's a very entitled veteran and supposedly a Purple Heart one. He's also a very racist MAGA-type jerk, one of the reasons my boss will not absolutely have him as a customer during business hours, but will work on his truck after hours with no one else around. The usual mo is he tries to fix something on his truck and screws it up, then expects everyone else to fix it for really cheap using his veteran status as a guilt trip because he already had done half the work himself. This time, he fixed his brakes and somehow no longer had rear brakes. His truck is two bolt failures away from a junkyard. My boss is out of town, 
so I was in charge for the week with strict instructions to not help him while he's out. He showed up at the shop today demanding I fix his truck. I had already closed the building up and was ready to leave. I told him when G gets back, he'll fix your truck. He didn't like that answer that said something I picked up on to be racist remark. I told him to get lost till G.A. gets back. He gets pissed and grabs a piece of wood and throws it into the desert. I start my drive home and a second or two later I notice his truck behind me and matching my lane changes. I live 40 miles away so I knew he wouldn't keep up with me in the hills and I didn't want to kill him by outpacing him. So I call my friend, who's only about 9, 10 miles in the middle of the desert and told him I was going to swing by because I think I'm being followed and I was going to take the scenic route. He told me he was going to meet me halfway, and if he had to, he would scare him off. The scenic route is seven miles of rough desert road that will destroy any truck without long travel suspension. A lot of locals use it to test and tune their desert off, rotors. I get to the turn off into the trail, and I see his headlights turn in behind me. At that point, I shut my lights off and turn on my desert headlights and floor it. I made sure to lure him into the first set of jumps. Right before the jumps, I kicked up a bunch of dust and turned off all the lights and waited at the other end. I saw his headlights again and I could tell he cleared the first jump, but I could see his headlights shake going down, which is a sign of suspension failure from hitting the ground hard. I turned on all my lights so he could see where I was as I left and proceeded to my friend's location. He was waiting for me with his brother and a big grin. He told me he saw me about a mile away because of the lights but couldn't see the other truck behind and he just said, looks like you must have missed the first jump, I'm gonna call rescue. We hung out another few minutes and took a different trail that led me to the highway home. Later in the evening, I got a call that he was fine but his truck was literally bent at the cab and bed from the five-foot drop he experienced. He said he got lost going home. I plan on calling G in the morning and letting him know I'm having that jerk trespass from the shop for that stunt. Update, G has been contacted. He's taking my side on this, and he's no longer welcomed at the shop. He's been formally trespassed by the sheriffs. I also saw the truck. It's literally bent with the bed and the cab pressed into each other at another shop. Background, background. This all went down in the late 1970s when my dad was 17. The area he grew up in was in the UK and was a stereotypical working class town. The part of town my family lived in was run down, full of poor families and had its fair share of crime. But it was close knit and everyone knew everyone. This will be important later. Now my dad wasn't the most well behaved kid and he had hated being at school. But aside from a speeding ticket, he had never been in trouble with the police. He was and still is a really talented musician, and had a very active social life. For his 17th birthday, one of his friends had bought him a leather jacket with a very specific logo on it. We'll call this friend Dave for future reference. According to my dad, it was a rare and quite expensive motorcycle jacket. He was extremely happy that Dave had got it for him. Dave had bought himself the same jacket a while before, and it was a big surprise. My grandmother apparently joked that with the jackets on, they looked like twins, and she wasn't far wrong. They had similar features, black hair, and were both well-known for being kitted out in motorcycle gear. A few days after my dad's birthday, he was leaving work as a bartender in the town center at around 10 p.m. As he was getting close to where his bike was parked, a gang of five men approached him from behind. The last thing my dad remembers was being smacked over the head and passing out as he hit the floor. These men beat up my dad with bike chains and a crowbar, literally to within an inch of his life. Luckily, two bouncers from a nearby pub had heard the commotion and rushed to help. The men ran off. The bouncers called the cops and my dad was taken to hospital. It turned out that Dave had quite a substantial gambling habit and owed a large amount of money to people who you really didn't want to owe money to. They had threatened Dave and told him that they would be looking for him to teach him a lesson. So Dave decided to set up my dad to take the beating instead of himself, or at least lessen his chances of taking it. He had bought my dad the same jacket because these guys knew that was what he wore when he rode. He then arranged for a guy he knew to find out when my dad left work and call up the loan sharks to let them know where Dave was. What a jerk. The revenge. My grandfather and grandmother were obviously distraught about this whole thing. The first thought on my grandfather's mind was if my dad would survive. When that was answered, his second was how best to get revenge. Bit of background on my grandfather. He was a lifelong boxer and a career military man. He enlisted at the back end of W-2 at 17. Stayed in the forces through Korea and then served in Malaya and Burma as a scout and sniper during the mid to late 1950s. He only reluctantly retired when my dad was little and worked as an engineer after his discharge. This guy was a certified badass even into his 50s, and although he wasn't the best husband or father at times, he could never stand by and watch his family get hurt. The first move my grandfather made was to call up every ex-service buddy, bouncer, pub landlord, etc. that he knew, and even a few less than legit characters he knew from the pub. In my town, word traveled fast. And my grandfather was well-liked and had a bit of a reputation. So it wasn't long before he had the names and addresses of the five men who had attacked my dad. 
Apparently, these guys had been bragging about beating up a defenseless man from behind. These guys were career criminals with violent reputations. But my grandfather really didn't care who or what they were. My grandfather then called up a few of the most dangerous, hardened guys he knew from the service. He explained to them what had happened, and they were all happy to help. One night, the group kicked in the doors of each thug and beat them to a pulp, all five of them. They knew that if they hit one, the others would hear about it and run, so they hit all five of them in one night. My grandfather knew that no one would call the police in the area they lived in. Talking to the cops was a big no-no in that area back then, so there was little chance of being caught. All five guys ended up bloodied with broken bones, shattered teeth, and the requirement to be fed from a tube by the end of the night. One of them had to be put into a medically induced coma. Of course, the police interviewed all of them in hospital when they sufficiently recovered, but none of them talked, both out of fear of my grandfather and fear of my grandfather and fear they would be labeled as rats, and nothing came of it. But my grandfather wasn't done there. My grandfather used his connections in the clubs and bars to start spreading rumors about why they had been beaten up. Soon it had gotten around that these five guys had screwed up and had beaten up the wrong person. Not only that, but they had bragged about it and lied to whoever they worked for about it. Not only were they physically broken, but my grandfather ruined their credibility so that when they got out, no one, criminal or otherwise, wanted to be associated with them. Once this was all done, my grandfather turned his attention to Dave. He had specifically left Dave for last, knowing that he would crap himself knowing that my grandfather knew what he had done. My grandfather, however, was much more subtle in dealing with Dave, as he thought that a simple beating would be too good for him. He waited and asked around, and it turned out that Dave was not only a compulsive gambler, but also had recently turned into a heavy drug addict as well. My grandfather found out who he was buying his drugs from, when he would usually buy and wear. He had a buddy of his follow Dave when he went to buy his stuff, follow him to where he was living and let my grandfather know. My grandfather then called in an anonymous tip that there was a huge drug deal going on at the address, and he thought he heard gunshots. He got two of his buddies to do the same. The police investigated, searched the house, and caught Dave red-handed with boatloads of drugs in his home as well as counterfeit bills and a ton of other illegal stuff. Dave was charged, denied bail, and ended up pleading guilty to all the charges laid against him. My dad could never remember his exact sentence, but it was definitely heavy, at least 15 years. To add to that, Dave owed a lot of money to a lot of people. And let's just say his time in prison was made much worse by this fact. My dad never spoke to him again. His parents disowned him, his girlfriend dumped him, he struggled to get a job with his record, and when he got out, he had to move miles away as no one he knew wanted anything to do with him. My dad eventually recovered from his injuries, although you can still see various scars on his body from the beating he took. My grandfather never told anyone what he had done until my dad asked him about it when he got really ill in the early 1990s. Dave's life was ruined, and out of the five who attacked my dad, three ended up in prison later in life, and two ended up dead due to crime. My grandfather passed away in the late 1990s. And although my dad and him had their issues, it could never be said he didn't look out for him when he needed it. Okay, for a bit of context, a few years ago, I was a part of a swim team at a public pool. The pool was divided into four sections. The shallow end, the recreational pool, the deep end, and lap swim. The recreational pool was split into two ends as well. The free swim on the deep end and the aerobic swim on the shallow end. It was summer right before sports tryouts for my brother and me. And part of the tryouts was treading water for 20 minutes and then putting on a life jacket in the middle of the water. To practice, we went to the free swim end of the recreational pool so that there wasn't a chance that we would touch the ground. On the other end of the pool, there was an aerobics class going on. So before we went in, we got explicit permission from the lifeguards on duty for us to do our training there. This aerobics class just happened to have an old lady, we'll call her Karen, in it. And she was eyeing us since the tryouts were in a river with tons of weeds and were pretty wavy. We thought it would be best to mimic them to an extent by using my swim cap to splash water on each other to mimic the waves. We were just splashing each other and timing each other to make sure that we could do it for long enough. And then we had each other put on goggles since we didn't have any life jackets. In that situation, they were equally as hard to put on while treading. On the side of the pool, there was this area where you could borrow goggles if you didn't have any. So I took one from there. We were in the middle of doing this for my brother and this is when Karen comes in. She started floating over to our side of the pool with her big blue floaty and gray hair. At first, we didn't pay much mind, but as she started getting closer to my brother, we politely asked her to go back to her side with her aerobics class. Miss, could you please move back to the other side of the pool? We're training here, and we don't want you to get splashed. I'm allowed to be here. This is the free side of the pool. It's my right to be here. It's not like you own the pool. That's true, but we just don't want to accidentally splash you. I'm staying... This is just as much my pool as it is yours. Since she was technically right, 
we just moved closer to the wall so that we didn't splash her. I went back to training with my brother and she continued to move closer, along with another lady from her aerobics class. We tried not to pay any mind to them, but they kept moving closer. By now, they were maybe three feet away from us and we were about a foot or two away from the wall, so we couldn't move much further without scraping our limbs against it. So I asked them, could you two please go back to the side reserved for aerobics? We don't want to splash you. We aren't touching you. There's still plenty of space for you to move. Why don't you leave us alone? Might I remind you that we were practically touching the wall at this point? Current me would have told her off right then and there, but I was only nine at the time and my coach was an earshot of us, so I didn't want to say anything to get myself in trouble. You're not touching us, but you are invading our space. You two have the whole other side on the pool to swim, but we only have these few feet, so please move. No, no, this isn't your pool and you have no right to be telling us to move. At this point, I was fed up and just wanted to finish training with my brother, so I just ignored her and went back to training. While I was dumping water on my brother, A singular drop flew out and splashed the Karen and she flipped. Lifeguard, help, help. She cried out making a scene, waving her hands and glaring at us. The lifeguard rushed over thinking someone was drowning or something. This girl was trying to drown this boy and us. And she tried stealing goggles. The life looked at me, holding my swim cap that was now empty of water. Then looked at my brother trying to put the goggles on from the borrow me bin. And then looked at Karen and her friend who had just gone underwater to make it look like I tried to drown them. Sorry, miss, but I'm going to need you to leave, the lifeguard told me. But it's not true, sir. My brother and I were just training. I tried to explain. Liar! Get out of here. We can't have her in here. She might go after the kids next. Karen, of course, couldn't stay quiet. Seriously? It was one drop of water. Yeah, I might have been playing a bit rough with my brother, but he had no problems with it. It was Karen's fault that she got wet after we asked her to move twice. I'm going to need you to put your things away and leave this section of a pool, miss. As I was being escorted to the locker room, I looked back and gave Karen and her friend a glare, and I saw my brother getting out of the pool. The next thing I know, he was jumping in, doing a full-blown cannonball next to them, drenching them in water. I was trying to contain my laughter as he got out, put the goggles back, and scurried back to the locker rooms, all the while Karen and her friend were screaming at us. This story takes place during the week my wife and I got married. I was 28 at the time. We had a destination wedding in the Bahamas, and it was amazing. We had 15 people who were able to join us. We had decided to pick Bahamas as it was the first place my wife had ever gone to for a vacation, and it's where I proposed to her. So for us, the week was pure magic. Now on to the story of my mother. I could write about her antics during the whole week, but I don't think people would want to read a book, so I'll only talk about the wedding day itself. It's Tuesday in the middle of our trip. Both my wife and I wanted to follow the don't see each other before the wedding ceremony rule. We've gotten some flack for it, but whatever. We were getting married off the resort in a small blue church in a nature sanctuary. I was to go to the park first, and my wife would follow. While waiting on the rides to the park for me, my best man, and our guests, my mom kept saying things like, it's Italian tradition for the mother to take photos with the groom before the wedding. It's Italian tradition for the mother to take photos with the best man and guests. This was getting annoying. But then my mother pulls me aside and starts to have a heart-to-heart talk to me, which I thought was going to go one way. It was basically a lecture about how important she is and how selfish I was. She actually said, this day isn't all about you and her. It ended with, it's Italian tradition to wear these cufflinks. I was expecting cufflinks that my grandpa wore at his wedding. I respected him greatly. He was a huge influence in my life. She pulls out these dollar store cufflinks and keeps trying to pass them off as a family heirloom. I later found out that she had bought them in Bahamas as an impulse buy. Also, my suit wasn't made with cufflinks in mind. Anyways, as the rides show up, my mother tells me, Oh, don't forget, it's Italian tradition for the mother to walk to the sun down the aisle. Everyone looked at her like she was crazy because even my jerk knows that's not a tradition anywhere in the world. I called her out on that and she started arguing with me. She sort of relented and told me, Well, if you're going to break your mother's heart, At least follow the Italian tradition of making your brother the usher. I told her that, like, only six people were coming with me, but fine, whatever. We finally leave, my mother deciding to stay behind to stay with the bride's side. Lord knows what crap she tried to pull with her. We get to the nature sanctuary and go to the small blue church that can hold maybe 40 people. Everyone just sits where they want, and my brother stands by the door to be the usher. Now, my wife's maid of honor is her best friend, and she's a sickeningly amazing person. Honestly, she's probably the most selfless person on the planet. However, her only flaw is that she's very loud. I bring that up because when my wife and everyone with her pulls up, you can hear her maid of honor, and the distance between the entrance to the park and the church is quite large. I perk up and get ready. 
when my brother, who is still standing by the door, says, I'm going to go have a smoke and explore the park. And I tell him, we just heard them pull up. No, no. He tries arguing with me about how he'll just take a quick look around, but finally just shuts up and gives me dirty looks for the rest of the day. The nature sanctuary is huge and very maze-like. The other guests show up. Everyone gets their seats. We didn't care who sat where. Real glad we had that usher. We start the ceremony, and I see my soon-to-be wife have bride come around the corner. My heart stops, and I realize that this is the best moment in my life. Everyone else apparently knew what I was thinking because I had a smile that went from ear to ear. Honestly, the two seconds of her coming around the corner made all my stress vanish. My wife looked at me and gave me a huge smile as, well, seeing her walk down the aisle is a memory I replay that in my head all the time. Sorry, not sorry for the sappy bit. Ceremony goes great. We do our vows. I can hear my best man behind me crying like his mom just got shot. After the ceremony, my mother is back into Italian tradition mode. It's Italian tradition for the mother to have a photo with the groom. It's Italian tradition for the mother to X. If I were to type out everything that was Italian tradition, no one would read this. Later, when we got our photos back, my mother had this scowl in her face the entire time. There's one that's my favorite because it's during the whole, do you take him to be part? And she has this look of like pure disgust and hatred. It's great. So we get back to the resort. We have our reception. My mother tries to start it out by saying, it's Italian tradition for the mother of the groom to do three speeches. My best man wasn't having any of that and put his foot down on who does a speech. He was so good and cool at keeping her insanity in control during the week. Everyone does their speeches. My now-in-laws do theirs and hand us a card. In it, it says when we get home, we will give you $1,000 as a wedding present. Awesome. Awesome. My mother tried a few more Italian traditions. As one was about her cutting the cake. Several were about her in various photos with people. The cap to the night after dinner My mother walks up to me and my now wife and says to her, how much did your parents give you? She was like, huh? And my mother goes, well, it's Italian tradition for the groom's parents to give double the bride's parents. We pause in confusion and told her they haven't given us anything yet, but they will give us $1,000 when we get home. My mother goes, good, I'll give you $3,000 then. We were like, okay, spoilers. My mother never gave us a single penny. It's been four years since our wedding and my mother still tries to tell people that she paid for everything. The wedding my suit, my wife's dress. Her grandma with dementia bought it for her so that really pisses off my wife. All 17, counting my wife and me, people's airfare, hotel, wedding ceremony, and so much more. The only thing she paid for was her and my brother's trip, and the only reason my brother even came was because it was a free vacation for him. And I'll end it with this fun fact. I'm half Italian, but I've never once in my life done anything Italian or have acknowledged my Italian half. My wife and I also don't care about tradition. She's Polish. I'm half Italian half Irish. We got married in a Christian Bahamian church. What's also funny is my mother refuses to call my wife her name. She just says, your wife in a snide tone. How are you and your wife kind of thing? Like very clearly saying that she isn't part of our family at all. So yeah, that's my Italian traditional wedding. And yes, I've cut that toxic woman out of my life.